<laughs> Let us pray. Eternal and everlasting God, our Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for another preaching moment for your glory, and we pray to Lord that your word would go forth and not come back void, but accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. In the name of Christ, we pray, God, and we give you thanks. Let us all say together, amen. Stand with me all over the building and turn with me to the epistle of James, the second chapter. The epistle of James, the second chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. Beginning with the 14th verse, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish man or woman, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab, a prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without deeds is dead. The scripture as it is written. Uh, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of God and each other. Uh, and turn to your neighbor. Someone grab them by the hand and say to them, friends. When it comes to your faith, put some flesh on them bones. Is uh, all my life I've heard people say things like some people talk a good game. I've, I've heard it on the basketball court where people, we'd be on the bus in the morning, bus 27, taking us from the hilltop to Hunt Junior High School. And uh, everybody was talking about what they could do. A lot of people talked a good game in their, in their mind. They were, they were a legend in their own mind. What they could do. And it was a different story when you got on the basketball court. Because between a 10-foot rim and a basketball on the hardwood, uh, when it was time to cash in the wolf tickets, we found out talk was cheap. Some people talked a good game about what they could do on the dance floor. Till the music started. Then you found out, you know, who um, had two left feet from those who really had some, some rhythm and some moves. Amen? Some people talked a good game about who they could whoop, how bad a cat 
they were. Uh, till one day somebody wasn't there to hold them back. <laughs> and we found out whose mouths was writing checks that they behind couldn't cash. Help me somebody. Some people talk a good game, and some people talk a good game when it comes to their faith. It is all talk. In the idiom of my grandmother, they, they, they trifling. It's say one thing and do another. Lately, we heard a lot of talk about people going to Washington and blowing up Washington, turning it up upside down. And whatever they mean by that, uh, James was considered one of the early church writers who, in a sense, blew up the church, turned it upside down by an epistle that ruffled more than a few people's feathers, particularly those in the religious world who talked a good game. And uh, historically, biblical historians and church leaders ascribe authorship of the book of James to the brother of Jesus. They refer to this as uh, the James the just one. Um, puts emphasis upon a practical faith. You might, one might say that the theme of this epistle is having a living faith versus a, a dead faith. It was in terms of, of audience to whom the author is is writing the primary audience. We today are the secondary audience. We're really eavesdropping on a conversation that James the Just One was, was writing to a particular people at a particular time who we believe were um, first century saints who were uh, scattered in the lower Asia Minor who had been run out of Palestine because of persecution. These were folks who were living a hard time. Christians during a time of persecution of Christians. They were poor, persecuted, and, and, and living from pillar to post. Perhaps in today's terms, they would have been among, among the 21 million refugees scattered worldwide. Um, looking for, in the words of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, but a crust of bread and a corner to sleep in. This wasn't the name it, claim it, call it, haul it comfortable Christians making a big deal out of small potatoes. Folks who had reduced their faith down to a bunch of gimmies. You know, where God is the cosmic bellhop that you place an order with and then have the nerve to get mad when you can't get to Benny's <laughs> quick enough and good enough. Uh, no, no, these were, these were folks who were persecuted by tyrannical worldly powers without uh, the daily things of bread and a roof over your head and a safe and comfortable place to, uh, to lay your head at night and close your eyes who uh, was subject to, to, to the kinds of diseases that set upon you when you cannot ensure... Uh, good personal hygiene because you don't have access to a clean glass of water. You know, two-thirds of the children in the world today don't have access to a clean glass of water and suffer from diseases that we don't get just because uh, there's fluoride in our water. You know, most of these kids today have never drank out the faucet. They haven't been raised on bottled water. Those of you who in my generation can remember when it, would, uh, it was a joke when people, we thought we'd never pay for water. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Y'all don't remember when water was free. And we remember the day we said we'd never pay for water. When we asked for, when you went over somebody's house and they asked you, would you like some some water, they grabbed a glass, they, they grabbed uh, last week's jelly jar that was this week's water glass. Come on, somebody. You didn't always have matching sets. 
went to the refrigerator or the ice box, got you a couple of pieces of ice or took a pick and, and picked off a couple of pieces of ice, put it in that jelly jar, now drinking glass, and you went to the faucet and ran some water out the tap and swirled it around so it would chill down and then handed it to them with a paper napkin. And they sipped on it and said, ah, because it was refreshing. <laughs> oh, come on, somebody. We, we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. Well, no bottled water. Folk wouldn't even thought of buying no water. I must remember coming from the playground or coming from outside when the girls played double dutch. And you was hot and thirsty on the way home, and you cut through somebody's yard. And when you saw the water faucet on the side of the yard at all, or the hose out in the yard, you turned on that stranger's hose and stuck your lips up to that faucet sideways and the water was running down your head on the other side. And everybody took their turn, put your lips on that same faucet. We had strong antibodies back then. I don't remember nobody getting sick. Now we can't half eat at a restaurant without getting a stomach virus. We done, we done got soft. Touch your neighbor and say, we done got soft. Drank from the hose. We were strong, but rode our bikes without helmets. The big kids put the little kids on the handlebars. I don't remember nobody falling. We had better balance back then. I'm just reminiscing a little bit since it's Black History Month. Kids were tougher back then because everybody got whooped outside in front of the neighbors. If you ever got whooped outside in front of the neighbors, raise your hand. Say, I've been buked and I've been scorned. <laughs> it, 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 Howard Thurman once said that Christianity was a faith of people whose backs are against the wall. Yes. Christianity was born, it was not the religion of the empire. It was a minority faith that, that, that went, had to survive every facile force of state and culture that attempted to stamp it out. Thrown in lion's den, torn asunder, sent to the gallows, heads chopped off, uh, poisoned, drowned, flayed by knives. And yet in the words of Evictus, heads, unblo heads bloodied but unbowed. This is who James, the just one, is writing to, blowing up the church because he, he's, he's, he's writing this epistle to correct some errors in the faith. And, and, and the main error he's correcting is his sense that there are some folks who are living a, 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 um, a dead faith. A faith ain't no, ain't no meat on them bones. They talking a good game, but the rubber ain't meeting the road. And he contrasts a living faith that's got some meat on the bones versus a, a dead faith. You know, talk is just cheap. Not, whether it's at the playground, huh? talk is, 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 is cheap. Uh, or, or, or whether when it comes to in, in the kingdom business, talk is, touch your neighbor, say talk is cheap. Talk is, is in the love game. Talk is cheap. Everybody who say they, they love you and they never leave you, don't believe it. Everybody, everybody who's lived long enough to know that Saying they love you is easier than acting like they love you. Say amen. If, if you've ever had a cause to sing that old song, everybody plays a fool somehow, just say amen under your breath. Don't put your business out there, but just say amen <laughs> under your breath. Talk is cheap, particularly in, 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 in the world of, of faith. James is, is writing as a corrective to those folks whose faith is, is, in his opinion, a dead faith because ain't no meat on them bones. Now, thematically, James, 
the, you, you could hang this epistle on three primary emphasis. One of them is, is he wants folks to avoid the sins of, of pride and, and hypocrisy and favoritism. Pride, hypocrisy, and favoritism. He says things like, why do y'all play favorites when the, when, the, when the public officials and the magistrates, the potent folk, impotent folk, you know, come up in church and you want to get all excited and, and march them up front, give them a seat up front. We'll come around during the election. You don't see them till the next election. And he says, ain't them the same folk who pass the policies that done put you in a hard place? Why are you acting like they validated you or that it's a big deal because they've come to church and and if, if you want to give somebody a seat up front, give it to Mother Johnson who just got out the hospital. Amen. But she'd been faithful to the church for years, paying her little tithes and offering. And then y'all don't even put her on the sick list. And then when she come back, you, you tell her she can't come in now because they, they praying or reading the scripture, which is okay to respect decorum. But you treat her like her life don't matter. Then you want to make a big deal because the mayor or the governor or one of the ball players come to church. And, and Mother Johnson been interceded in prayer for you and your family that's hanging by the thread and the ball players they never thought nothing of you. But you make a big deal out the wrong people. And sometimes in church we make a big deal out the wrong people. Come on, sometimes we make a bigger deal out of people than God. If, if LeBron James came up here and I said, Brother, sister, Mr. LeBron James is here, y'all would stand to your feet and start clapping and yada, yada. He ain't going to give you a dime of that contract he got. Oh, come on, somebody. And I got to beg you to give your own children a hand. Sometimes we make a big deal out the wrong people. Sometimes I got to ask you two, three times to give God a praise. I came down from here a few weeks ago and told some of y'all, get up. Cause we, and and, and I, some people just sat there and looked at me. <laughs> Wouldn't even give God a praise. He said, avoid the, sin, the, the, the sins of pride, hypocrisy, and favoritism in the church. And because and, uh, that's a dead faith. That's a dead faith. Um. He also, in, 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 in this epistle, uh, wants us to live by the wisdom of God rather than the wisdom of, of man. The wisdom of God by the wisdom of man. Sometimes what makes sense to man is as foolishness to God, or what makes sense to God is as foolishness to man. Turn the other cheek. Love those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who despitefully use you. That's, that's not the wisdom of this world. That's, but that's the wisdom of God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are spiritual. That's, that's the wisdom of God. Recompense no man evil for evil. Overcome evil with good. Heap coals of fire on the head. I've been, I've been watching Madiba. Many series on Mandela when they put him in prison and uh, he was respectful to the guards and one of some of the other inmates said they said he wanted to be more confrontational with the guards he said sometimes you got to teach people how to be civilized sometimes you got to be good to somebody who's being nasty to you to show them what being good it looks like and is all about. Sometimes you have to convict them of their nastiness. You got somebody who frowns at you, rolls your eyes at you, sucks their teeth. When you walk through the narthex, just look at them and say, good morning. <laughs> Do just like my dear Tyler Perry, say, good morning. Just keep on saying it. Go get them a napkin and hand it to them. Go get a, give them a stir stick and hand it to their coffee. Go get them some sugar. I see you needed another cup. The same person that rolled their eyes at you wouldn't let you sit down. See, see, see if love is stronger than hate. See if goodness is stronger than evil in the long run. See, see, see if kindness is stronger than evil. Sometimes you got to shame folks. 
Make it hard for them to continue to be nasty by you being good. See if you're more committed to being good than they are to being evil. It's not that they're evil, but sometimes they're more committed to being evil than we are to being good. You're going to put some flesh on them bones. Come on, somebody. He says we got to live by the wisdom of God and not by the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of the world says they started it. Anybody heard that lately? They started it. But the wisdom of God says uh, overcome evil with, with, with good. And, uh, but the heart of his, his, his epistle here is, is this, he writes as a corrective to this whole notion of faith and works. In, in James' opinion, some people had confused this whole conversation about justification by faith to mean that uh, faith alone is an adequate walk with God. Faith alone is an adequate walk with God. He writes not with indifference to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, but as a corrective to people's dead response to it. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says we are saved by grace through faith, not of our works, nor of ourselves. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. That justification, and justification was a legal term. It means to make it right. It means to, to, to be put back in proper legal standing as if there had never been an injury in the first place. And Ephesians lets us understand that our standing with God is solely based upon the perfect work of Jesus Christ on the cross without any works on our part to complete the work of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's Jesus only. If it's Jesus plus anything, then that meant what Jesus did is not enough. If it's Jesus plus pay your tithes, then that means that the work of Jesus Christ was inadequate. If, 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 it's, if it's Jesus plus be in church every Sunday, then that meant what Jesus did is not enough. If it's Jesus plus sing in the choir and be on the greeting ministry and the parking ministry, at least three different ministries, then that means what the work of Jesus Christ did was not enough. It, it, it wants us to know that uh, we can't claim... Uh, we can't make any claim of being responsible for our own salvation. We are saved not because of ourselves, but in spite of ourselves. Amen. We have standing with God in spite of ourselves. We are saved because God did something that canceled out everything we've done and is not somehow or another an accounting of our merits versus demerits that when you add them up, we've got enough merits in comparison to a demerits to earn heaven. You ain't never going to earn heaven. You can never be good enough. He wants us to understand that, that Ephesians would let you know, Martin Luther would say, if you think that your standing with God, your, 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 your redeemed status before God has anything to do with what you've done right, you are fool. Turn to your neighbor and look at them and see if they look like a fool today. They, if they look like, don't call them one. I'm just saying. Look at them and see if they look like they think that their standing with God has to do with the fact that they've been so good. And you can tell people who, who think their standing with God is rooted in the fact they think they've been so good because they don't like the praise because they don't think it take all that. You can... They, they come to church late, want to leave early. They're constantly looking at their watch like this is more of an obligation than a, than a joy because people who understanding, understand that they are saved uh, in spite of themselves have an attitude of gratitude. Oh, come on, somebody. You don't have to beg them to give God a praise because they are never forgetful of just how sinful they are, just how jacked up, messed up. We, we can put a suit on, but you're still a sinner. You can take a shower, but sin still stinks. Come on, somebody. In the nostrils of God, you can get a touch up, and yet, but still know that you need a touch of the master's hand. Some people have the unmitigated gall to sit up here all smug 
come to church and not want to sweat out their hair and sweat up their clothes, even for God, as if they didn't need nothing from God. But I wonder if those in the house who know that you needed and need and will need something from God can take your mind off your hair, your clothes, just long enough to give God about three, four seconds to show him a little gratitude for saving your broke down self. Come on, somebody. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Ephesians is very much rooted in the gratitude of, of someone who knows that their salvation is totally owing to God and not at all owing to ourselves. Some people interpreted that if, if my salvation is totally owing to God, then that means I don't got to do nothing. It's always somebody wants to take a good idea and take it to a bad place. Come on, somebody. And that's what James was doing as a corrective when he comes behind Ephesians. Not so much to correct Ephesians, but to correct how trifling saints were applying Ephesians to, 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 as a justification and excuse for a lazy, do-nothing faith that was a lip service. As Jesus said in Matthew 15 and 8, you serve me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. James asked some practical questions. What good is faith without works? Faith without works. He says, if somebody's hungry, come to you, and you pray for them. You want to stop and pray for them, and, and, and then tell them after you pray for them. They came to you hungry, and, uh, uh, and, and you're on your way to lunch somewhere. And you're going to pray for them and then send them all their way and say, you know, may the Lord be with you. God bless you real good. And, and you give them some little trite, polite saying like, uh, you know, God, God never fails. He going to, you know, he may not come when you want him. And, 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 and you, you have a credit balance on your credit card or you got money in your account for your debit card. You could tell them, well, I'm getting ready to go get something to eat right now. Why don't you come with me? Come on, somebody. You could reach in your, you could walk over to the ATM machine and give them some money right then. But at that point, you start saying, well, you know, you know, God helps those who help themselves. And now all of a sudden, you're, all your rationalized, all your exit ramps from living faith start playing out in your head. And you give yourself every excuse, justification, rationalization in the world to do anything more than talk your way through this moment. Come on, somebody. You, and they come to you and leave you just as hungry, just as homeless, just as lonely, just as desperate. Your faith never gets beyond the lip service. He says, what use is that? It's a useless, in a hurting, hungry, homeless, dangerous, abused world. We have a useless faith. A useless, a, a, a useless faith. You know, sisters, y'all can relate to this. What, what, what good is, 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 is a man that won't do nothing for you? Huh? You, you, you know, you know, Sam Cook talk, you know, we talk about his sugar dumpling, you know, and he says, I, I, I call her in the morning and, and, and say, fix me something to eat. And before I hang up the telephone, she's sitting beside me with a cup of coffee in her hand. He, he, that's my sugar dumpling. He said, you know, he says, I ask her to dinner. She'll fix me a dinner with seven different kinds of meat. Now, I don't know that woman, you know, <laughs> fix me a dinner with seven different kinds of meat. <laughs> Every, Every woman I've ever known would tell you, you better go on somewhere talking about seven dip. But I can, get, I can get some meat between a few slices of bread if I say I'm hungry. What good is somebody who can't respond practically to a need? But then there's a lot of women with a man won't do nothing. What good is a, you calling him your man? You, you call him your man and he's dressed up, manicured, hair all lined, mustache all laid and, and all spiffied up, cute, cuter than a peacock, driving a nice car that always keeps all cleaned and, 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 and shined up and you on the bus and your clothes are ragged and, and you, you can't afford a touch up and you run around 
telling people he's your man and he looking like the prince at the ball and you looking like Cinderella before she meets the fairy godmother and and you talking about you have a man and he's riding living large and you on the bus seem to me you don't have a man uh, you got a bad habit come on somebody you you that ain't no, but what, what, what good is having somebody call somebody your man, but he ain't doing nothing for you? Sisters, can I get an amen? Seems like if you're going to call somebody your husband, your boyfriend, they ought to be doing, they, he ought to at least be able to kick in for a touch-up. Come on, somebody. If that's your man, you want him to put some flesh on them bones. Huh? You know, there's a lot of wisdom to the old saying, no romance without finance. Come on, somebody. Anybody hugging up on you and kissing on you and come on somebody coming by to see you ought to be looking around to see what you need doing something for you. If I can, I get two, three witnesses up in here. He got to bring something to the table. You know, your faith ought not be like a trifling man. I just said something there. Your faith ought not behave like a trifling man. All talk, no action, not coming through for anybody. He says, faith without works is dead. He says, you say I got faith and I say you got, I got works. He says, I will show you my faith by my works. By my works. I, and, and he would say it is, he says, Abraham, Abraham showed his faith. When he was willing to offer Isaac unto God, and God told him at the last minute, stay your hand. And he says, Abraham, believe God. It was imputed unto him for righteousness. It was what he was willing to do for God that caused God to declare him a righteous man. Huh? And, and, and he's, he's not trying to get you to think that it's what we do is what entitles us to redemption before God. We don't get saved by what we do. But if we are saved, there are things we will do because we can't help it. So that the works become confirmatory. It confirms itself. So that when there are no works, it reaches back and exposes that the claims of faith are not valid in the first place. We're not working to get saved, but if we are saved, there's going to be some works. Because saved folks got a case that they can't help it. Huh? Said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I can't keep it to myself what the Lord has done for me. Not just my testimony is, 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 is a, a case that they can't help us, but the labor, the love, what I do for others, what I do in the name of Jesus, what I do after the benediction before the next invocation confirms that all them shouting and hollering, singing and preaching that I did during the service, that it was authentic and real. Because if there is nothing after the benediction, addiction before the next invocation then you send it up testimony and not testimony it's dead it's dead see he's talking to hard time saints whose backs are against the wall and when you are living a life when you're living from pillar to post you, you, dead faith is exposed quickly when you're preaching to folks, everybody got enough, then all you got to do is preach, give them a song, they can go home, that's all they need. But when you're preaching to refugees, women in the shelter who had to leave their homes because Bubba beat her up, and she had to grab the kids and run. She need more than your prayer. She'd been praying all night. Somebody come along and help her find a roof over her head. Huh? When you're talking about somebody who just came out to joint, trying to integrate back into society, got a felony record, put it down on an application, won't nobody hire them. But if you tell them up front, they rip up the application. They trying to get footing back and go the right way and do the right thing and stay clean and sober and stay away from the old crew. They need more than your prayer. They've been praying for themselves. When you're dealing with this people whose backs are against the wall, faith that don't have no works is meaningless to that crowd. And so James comes along, and in a sense, when he, when he talks about the relationship between faith and works, he, he's really saying, Sister Sarah, it's as if he's saying, we, we, we've, got to, 
We've got to we, 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 we've got to work like everything depends on us, but then pray like everything depends on God. Hmm? We've got to work like everything depends on us, and pray like everything depends on God. I told you about the three themes that he says uh, uh, in this book. Don't be guilty of the sins of pride, of hypocrisy, uh, 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 of, of favoritism. Uh, uh, live by the wisdom of man and not the wisdom of, 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 of God. But then also in everything pray. That's the third theme of the book. In everything pray. Everything pray. Because we got to work like everything depends on us. Pray like everything depends on God. We got to pray. We're going through trials and tribulations. He says, let trial perform its perfect work. We got to pray. When you're going through trials, you got to pray. You got to pray because prayer will remind you you're not in this thing by yourself. Because prayer reminds you there's somebody on the other end of that thing. If you, you're in a refugee cramp, if you don't have nothing but the clothes on your back, or if you don't even have the clothes on your back, if you just got evicted, are you facing eviction? If you don't have no job, if your bills are due, you don't know where the money's coming from. If you can't trust your husband, your father, or the boyfriend, come on, somebody, because they all abuse you. You, you got you to gotta pray and know that there's somebody on the other end. There's people today who are sane only because they pray enough to remind their own soul that, that, that over their head there must be a God somewhere. I enslaved, buked, and scorned, mutilated, abused, raped, and, and, uh, and despised slave forepairs stayed sane because they knew how to pray and believe that there was a good Lord in spite of this mean old world. There was a good Lord over their head. Come on, somebody. You got to prayer to keep you sane. Prayer to keep you in the game. Prayer to keep you fighting. Prayer to keep you holding your peace and let the Lord fight your battles. Prayer to keep you running because you realize that you got a tailwind behind you and not just the headwind of man's foolishness in front of you. Prayer to stop you from slapping somebody. Call, come on, somebody. Y'all ain't feeling me this morning. I used to hear the old folks say, every morning I pray, pray every morning because I just can't make it by myself. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week that comes my way. But I pray every morning because I just can't make it by myself. William Cullen Bryant once said his prayer every day was, Lord, never leave me to myself lest I fall and go astray. I wonder how many people in here know you got some stuff in you that if you don't pray, you can mess up your whole life today if you you don't pray. Come on, somebody. You, there's some words in you. There's some anger in you. There's some sinful impulses in you. Come on, somebody. There's some stuff you barely got tamped down if you were foolish enough to try and live one day without the power of God, you can ruin your whole I wish I had four or five people in here who's honest enough to know that your worst enemy is the one that looks at you in the mirror. You better pray. I, yeah, I pray for you, but I'm praying for Leslie more than I'm praying for Eugene and Sarah, you know, because I know if I don't pray for Leslie, my prayers for Eugene and Sarah ain't going to matter. I am my biggest problem. How many of you know your biggest problem, the name is I, me, and my? Those of you sitting down, I'm praying for you because you should have been the first ones jumping up with your raggedy self. Huh? I feel like preaching this morning a little bit. Listen, you can sit down. I'm almost there. You got to work like everything depends on God while you pray like everything depends on, work like everything depends on you. Pray like everything depends on God and put some flesh on them bones. Listen, listen, how, how can I make it simple? I, 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 I. There's an old folk tale, African-American folk tale, about a father who was walking down the street, grandfather with his granddaughter, and walking down the street. And while they was taking a walk, they saw uh, a dog, a hungry, rabid dog. Big dog chased a cat into an alley. Hungry dog salivating the mouth, saw this cat, chased the cat into the alley, cornered the cat, a little old cat. Hunched its back, hissed something awful, pulled out them claws, 
It looked like it was going to be the end of that cat. That big old dog chased it down, tracked it down, cornered it. But then as that dog approached that cat, that cat was fighting like there was 10 of them. Scratched up the dog, scratched him on his nose. And next thing you know, you went from hearing the barking of the dog to went from a deep bass-like bark to a high-pitched squeal as that dog ran on out that alley. That cat was standing there. And the little girl asked her grandfather, said, Grandpa, how come the dog wasn't able to, to get the cat? How did the cat survive? And the grandfather told her, he said, this is the lesson of this, my daughter. She said, the cat was able to survive the dog. He said, because the dog was fighting for its next meal, but the cat was fighting for its life. Oh, you don't hear me. The dog was fighting for its next meal, but the cat was fighting for its life. You're not feeling me. You see President Trump and all these billionaires that have brought to the White House, they fighting for their next meal. But the people who are in the streets, they fighting for their life. Come on, somebody. The only reason why he's in Washington is because we got complacent. And didn't realize we were fighting for our lives. And see, when you get complacent, a dog will back you into a corner. But you got to at least have sense enough to know that now you're backed into a corner and you better fight like everything depends on you. We need to pray like everything depends on God, but you better fight like everything depends on you because there's some dogs out there trying to devour some people. There's some dogs out there trying to devour immigrants, immigrants. There's some dogs out there trying to devour poor people. There's some dogs out there trying to devour public education. There's some dogs out there trying to devour your health care. There's some dogs going on the Supreme Court trying to devour the rights that women have fought for. There's some dogs out there trying to devour our voting rights. There's some dogs out there trying to devour workers' rights. There's some dogs out there trying to devour gays and lesbians and push them back into the closet. There's some dogs out there. You better pray like everything depends on God, but then you better hunch up your back. You better pull out your claws, and you better let somebody know you ain't in no mood to be some dog's next meal. Come on, somebody. You better put some flesh on them bones. Do you have a living or a dead faith today? That's the question. I know that my standing before God has everything and only to do with what the Lord has done for me. But now because I have this standing in with God, got to stand and fight. Got to stand and serve. If I don't, it will expose that my faith is just all lip service in the first place. Touch your neighbor and ask him, is you just talking? Is there something real in your faith? Doors of the church are now open. <laughs>